Yay, everybody's here. We all good? Can you all unmute for a minute so we can do a mic check and then we're going to get started? Hello. Hi. 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 Everybody <laughs> good? Awesome. Yeah. That be a reminder to redo your name tag. Yes. And we are live on air. Thanks, everybody, for your patience. We're about 15 minutes behind schedule. Um, and we apologize for that, but we appreciate your patience as we figure out how to make sure this is all on air correctly. So we're just going to jump right into it. Um, my name is Tiffany Aquino. I am losing my video here. Hold on. There we go. Um, I am a, an alum of the GHG program. I was in Rwanda last year, um, and I'm so excited about this uh, Google Hangout today. Um, the purpose of the Hangout basically is just to invite all potential applicants and other community members that want to get more involved um, to meet us, to be able to engage with us and ask us questions, learn more about the fellowship program, and hear about experiencing the fellowship from the people who experienced it. So we just wanted to make ourselves more accessible to, to everybody who's interested in joining us, um, and we're excited that you took time out of your day today to do that. Um, so welcome, and I'm going to pass it on to Jen now, who is going to give us a little intro to GHC um, and go over some of the basic questions that were submitted online. Okay? Great. Thanks, everyone, so much um, for spending your Friday night with us. We're very excited. Um, I'm the U.S. Program Manager. My name is Jennifer Gottesfeld, as, as Tiffany mentioned, and I'm actually also a former fellow. So I was a fellow in 2011-2012 with Baylor International Pediatric AIDS Initiative in Malawi. And after I give my, um, my brief intro to Global Health Corp to give you guys a little bit more background information, we'll have all the rest of the fellows and alums on the call um, give their background to you as well. Um, so just to, to get you up to speed on, on Global Health Corps in case um, you're new to uh, the organization, um, Global Health Corps is a one-year paid fellowship where um, fellows work, I like to think of them as internal consultants within an already existing organization. Um, they work on identified issues that the organization has um, in order to build organizational capacity. So how it works is we'll identify organizations in one of the five countries in um, Sub-Saharan Africa that we work in, which is Rwanda, Uganda, and Burundi in Eastern Africa, and Zambia and Malawi in Southern Africa, or in the United States in Malawi, I'm sorry, in the United States, um, in New York, Newark, um, Washington, D.C., or Boston, um, and we'll find organizations that we think fit the mission and vision of Global Health Corps, um, and they're really advancing health equity, and we'll say, hey, what, um, what resources do you need? What um, gaps do you have that you really wish you could fill that you just don't have the human resources to fill? And they'll come back to us with two job descriptions. And I'll get back to the two job descriptions in a second. But um, they'll come back to us with two job descriptions based on, um, on what they need. And we don't have any agenda in, in that, other than it can't be clerical or administrative work. Um, but those job descriptions look like what you would normally expect for um, a health fellowship, so program management, health promotion, um, but then other things such as uh, supply chain management, procurement and logistics, monitoring and evaluation, even architecture, where we have architects working with the Ministry of Health in Rwanda to design better rural hospitals. Um, so the variety of different types of uh, opportunities is very vast, and the reason that that is is because the needs in global health are very vast, and we recognize that having people with those different skills and experiences all at the table together um, really strengthens the conversation and diversifies um, people's knowledge of the field of global health. Um, so we have, and I said I'd come back to the why we have two job descriptions. Um, we have two fellows placed at every organization. We have a national fellow and an international fellow, um, and we consider them to be co-fellows. And the reason that we have that is because collaboration is one of the most important things to Global Health Corps. We recognize that this is not 
um, or the field of global health is not something that people are going to be able to change on their own and that through collaboration is really where we will have our strength and be able to change things. And so within every organization we have two fellows placed someone from the country and someone from outside of the country. And, um, and that's important also for cross-cultural communication, for both being able to understand the cultural implications on the ground as well as bringing in new information from outside, and it's a really wonderful model. Um, so for people who are um, interested in working in Africa, the international right now um, is a U.S. citizen, and then the national would be the person from that country. So as you're looking at the job descriptions, um, you'll be able to tell what you're eligible for based on, um, based on your citizenship. However, if you're interested in working in the United States, the American citizen would be the national fellow, and the international fellow is from anywhere in the world. Um, you can apply no matter what citizenship you have other than American, of course. Um, so to give you an overview of what the fellowship looks like and what it feels like and is to be a fellow, um, we all start at the same time. The fellowship starts um, the last week in June this year, in 2014, um, and we kick off with a two-week training institute that we hold at Yale University, where we fly all of our fellows from all over the world together to meet one another. Again, in the spirit of collaboration and recognizing that building a cohesive movement requires people actually getting to know one another. And so all of the fellows get together for two weeks um, to learn from one another and get to know one another, but we also bring in leaders in the field to speak directly to them about different issues that they specialize in. We have a lot of team building activities and professional development. Um, and the themes that we start at training, we then um, continue to pull out through the rest of the year. So. After the two-week training, I really hope you can't hear the ambulance behind me. I'm very sorry if you can. Um, <laughs> um, but So after the two-week training, everyone goes off to their um, respective locations to start their fellowship. And um, throughout the year, on a quarterly basis, we pull um, the fellows together e either by country or by region to continue that training. And, um, and the three pillars that we really focus on for training is um, professional development, of course, intellectual um, intellectual uh, exploration and interior formation. Um, and we delve into all of the pressing issues um, going on in global health and really give people the opportunity to both talk about um, what's going on globally as well as what's going on locally. Um, but in addition to those touch points, um, we have throughout the year also a distance learning platform where fellows are able to collaborate with one another, send emails to one another um, to ask questions about the work that they're doing and a lot of other ways that fellows can continue to interact throughout the year um, without getting to see one another all of the time. But then at the end of the year, uh, we have a culminating exit retreat where again we pull all of our fellows together uh, in East Africa for a um, wonderful debrief and sort of reflection of the year and then planning on how they're going to move forward. Um, in addition to the training workshops and um, other ways uh, that um, fellows are able to connect with one another. We also have um, a lot of other types of programs that are offered. So one of them is our opt-in advisor program. Our opt-in advisor program, our fellows will at the beginning of the year fill out a form letting us know what they're looking for in a mentor, someone who um, can really help them both in their day-to-day -day work but also sort of vision their careers. And we'll go out and based on what they're looking for, find someone um, that's as a, their best fit for them. And they get to um, have this person as an advisor throughout the year and maintain that relationship for the rest of their careers. In addition, we also have a professional development fund. Um, which is $600, and fellows are able to tap into that fund for any type of professional development that they're interested in. Some fellows use it to take GRE classes and apply to graduate school. Other fellows use it to travel to another site where fellows who are working on a similar project as them are working and, um, and get a chance to really be hands-on and see how they're doing that project, and many other things as well. Um, so what do you get as a fellow? Um, first of all, we at GHC believe that in this field you can do well and do good at the same time. And withholding to that belief, um, we we pay our fellows a livable stipend um, that's based on the cost of living of the country. In addition to also providing housing, utilities, medical insurance, transportation to and from the country, as well as to the retreats, um, and uh, 
also visa fees, covering any types of visa fees and, and other expenses that are work-related. Um, and those are either covered by, by Global Health Corps or by the partner organization um, where fellows are working. Um, in addition, um, we also have, uh, so we, of course, want to, um, provide financial support for our fellows, but we also um, believe that fellows need to be supported in other ways. And, and what are those other ways? So we have an accompany pro accompaniment program with a fabulous organization called Still Harbor, um, where th we recognize that doing this work is challenging and sometimes you face things that are, are difficult to process on your own. And with that in mind, we have this wonderful program where fellows can um, access them whenever they need to really process any challenging issues that they've faced um, either in their work, in their personal life, um, but just to recognize that the people who are doing the work also need support too. Um, and so we are very happy that we're able to provide fellows that support. Um, so to give you a little bit of background on, on the requirements, um, to apply to the fellowship, you need to be 30 years old or younger. And that's, and you, so you can be 30 during your fellowship and at the time of um, when the fellowship starts. So um, we unfortunately are unable to uh, bring in people that are older than that age. We get a lot of questions about why, um, and it just has to do with really making sure the cohort is um, within the same age range and also recognizing that this is an early to mid-level career professional development program and so and so that's that's one of the reasons why we have to do that um, but in addition you the only other requirement is that you at least need to have a undergraduate degree by July 2014 um, so those are the only two um, major requirements and then we also ask that you um, are able to speak English proficiently but we don't look for people who have a health background certainly not a medical background um, and we also uh, aren't looking for people necessarily with international experience all of those may or may not be helpful um, but certainly not required um, so what types of organizations? Um, I hope that you've gotten a chance to look at our website and look at the job descriptions. But just to give you some highlights, we work with wonderful um, international, large international organizations like Partners in Health and Clinton Health Access Initiative. But we also work with a lot of small grassroots organizations as well as public-private partnerships, ministries of health, and other government agencies um, in the United States like the Boston Public Health Commission. So there's a lots of different types of opportunities. So I um, highly recommend that after you are done watching um, our Google Hangout to really explore the job descriptions and figure out which ones fit best for you, um, which ones you're most interested in and match your skills. Um, there's, there are so many to choose from. It's very exciting. So the applications are currently open online and they close on January 26th. And, um, and the fellowship begins, like I said, the last week of June in um, 2014 and goes until August of 2015. Um, so I think that's the end of my spiel and I'll be ha happy to answer any questions as we go further. Thank you, Jen. Thanks so much for that. Um, hopefully that answers a lot of the most frequently asked questions. Um, just so that everybody knows, we did take all of your questions that you submitted on Twitter and email and on the RSVP form, and we condensed them down. So we've had close to 400 RSVPs, so you can imagine the amount of questions. So we looked for the questions that are most commonly asked, so we can make sure we get as much done as we can today. Um, so hopefully Jen answered a lot of your basic questions about the fellowship, but please do review the website because a lot of this detail is on there as well. Um, so I'm going to jump in to let everybody else introduce themselves, um, and then we'll get started after that. So we'll just start with Aaron and work our way down. Guys, Aaron, yeah, so I'm Aaron Gale, I'm a current fellow um, placed at Vecna Cares in Boston, um, and let's see what else, school. I um, did my undergrad at Northwestern and just finished a master's at um, USC. And yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> okay, Debbie? Go ahead, you're on mute though, babe. Excellent. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Debbie Imperador, and I worked at the Infectious Diseases Institute as a distance learning fellow, and was which is based in Kampala, Uganda. 
last year, so 2012 and 2013. In school, I got my bachelor's from Dickinson College, and I got my master's in public health from UC Berkeley School of Public Health. And now I am working at the CDC doing rotavirus vaccine research for the APHL CDC Emerging Infectious Diseases Lab Training Fellowship. Thank you, Debbie. Jen, we already got you, so we're going to jump to Latifa. If you can give us your information and unmute yourself first. All right. Um, my name is Latifa Chiribeda. I am um, a Global Health Corps alumni in 2012-2013. I worked with a USAID-funded program called Strengthening Decentralization for Sustainability. And I'm the Ugandan fellow, so I'm happy to be representing the continent, you know. Oh, and school. <laughs> I'll tell you about school. I went to St. Catherine <laughs> University in Minnesota. So I've, I had my bachelor's degree, and now I'm pursuing my MBA um, at the University of St. Thomas. Awesome. And to what Latifa said, we had other fellows um, from Africa on the call, and because of technical difficulties and time changes and schedule changes, mm -hmm. they just all dropped out, unfortunately. So hopefully mm -hmm. for our next hangout, we'll have a a better representation, but we love yeah. Lativa. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to Siobhan. Hey everyone, my name is Siobhan Kelly, and I'm currently a fellow at Last Mile Health in Boston, and I just graduated from my Master's in International Development from Clark University. Awesome. And Virginia, last but not least, Hi, I'm Virginia, and I am a current fellow. I'm the Research and Evaluation Fellow at Children's Health Fund in New York. I did my undergraduate degree in, at the School of Oriental and African Studies of London and my master's degree in public health at Oxford University. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So now we're going to just jump right into these questions and also I just want to encourage you all if you have additional questions or something that you just want answered before the end of the call at the last 10 minutes if we have time we'll take a couple extra questions so if you tweet them um, tweet them with the hashtag GHC hangout and we will check Twitter towards the end of the call and see if we have any good questions to answer okay um, so we're just going to jump right in with Latifa um, this is one of the most commonly asked questions, Latifa. What was the most rewarding or satisfying experience of your fellowship year? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief. That's a really great question. And um, Health Corps, there is just so many rewarding experiences. And apart from the tangible work experience, I have to say, it was joining a community of like-minded individuals. And the reason why I say that, being an African woman who grew up in Uganda, raised, you know, went and fetched water and had um, my experience growing up in Uganda, went to secondary school in Uganda, and then pursued my bachelor's degree in the United States, I have always aspired um, to make a contribution to improving the lives of uh, people in my country. So when it came to assignments, I would always draw from my experience growing up. I would draw from the experience that my family and communities go through. So to join this community of people who are different, just like people see us, we look very different, we have different backgrounds, we have different experiences growing up, but each person that you see and each person that you join in the Global Health Corps community genuinely cares from the conversations you have to the experiences that people share with you. It's a community of people that really genuinely care about the work that they are doing. And um, when you join the community, even when you have a job or a volunteer experience or you're trying to build an organization, you can always reach out to people and ask for resources. So let's say you have a position in data management or monitoring and evaluation or any of those big words that we use all the time. By a drop of an email, you can ask someone and say, you know what, I'm working on this project and I'm just trying to figure this out. And just in minutes, you'll have, you know, 10 emails pouring in with people telling you what resources you need to make things happen. You don't have that often. So I really believe in our mission. I believe we are building a real movement. 
because I think any movement is supposed to have a community that believes in it, and I'm just really blessed to be a part of this community. And then second, uh, the job opportunities. You know, a long time ago, we used to look for jobs. In Global Health Corps, the, the jobs are kind of looking for you. It's kind of ironic. But, um, you know, you, you, you will always have people saying, you know, Clinton Health Access Initiative is hiring, you know, Last Mile Health is hiring, UNICEF is hiring, and you have jobs coming at you, and it's really up to you to figure out what it is you want to do and if a job is a good fit for you. So for me, again, it's the community, it's the friendships, Beyond the professional part, I've, I've grown to have really deep friendships interculturally, which is something that I did not think I could have. When I was going to school, you know, we would talk about the weather with some of my colleagues who are white, and it's like, oh, how is the weather? How is it going? And you didn't think you could build a real genuine friendship with people who are different from you. But some of the friends that I have now that will probably come to my wedding are Global Health Corps fellows. So. Um, I just want to tell everybody I really enjoy being a part of the community and I would wish any young person who wants to join this community to know they are, build, they are really joining a movement that is worthwhile and that will develop them both personally and professionally. Thank you, Latifa. That was really sweet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to give you a hug, but you're far away. You're in Minnesota, so digital hug. <laughs> um, so we're going to jump to the next question. Um, what about people outside of health or with different backgrounds? A lot of people are asking specifically with IT and engineering and things like that. Um, do they actually have a chance of getting a fellowship? Um, and then in addition to that, what about people just out of undergrad that may not have enough work experience? Um, so we're going to jump over to Aaron for this first answer. Uh, yes, I think that's, I mean, that's obviously a really good question. Um, especially with how much of what goes on usually in global health, you tend to see a lot of people who, you know, have been working in the field for a few years and a lot of people with public health degrees. And um, I think Global Health Corps is actually really great at pulling people from all backgrounds. I mean, my placement in particular, so Vecna Cares is a nonprofit doing um, health technology work in clinics all over the world. And neither my co-fellow nor I necessarily have a formal tech background uh, nor a formal healthcare background. I've, my background is in environmental science and uh, my co-fellow Dan Aceda has really been a real jack of all trades. He's a pop musician and architect and uh, runs his own media studio back in Kenya. Um, but I think the important thing to note is that with you know, with all of the 106 fellows in, all, in our class and everybody I've met who's been a fellow in past years, it's just being passionate about the issues and caring about health equity and it doesn't matter the, the experiences you've had in the past or the skills you bring to the table as much as just really wanting to make a difference and once you start from that, it then goes to if you fit with a specific organization. and. I think regardless of the skills, anybody can do that as long as you care. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. Um, we're also going to call on Siobhan to answer this one. You can add a little more to that. Yeah. Um, great answer, Aaron. Um, so I think just the only thing to add would be that I came straight out of you know my undergrad, and then I did an accelerated master's program. So this is my first job. So I was pretty intimidated to join a group of folks who had years of experience in the field, had their masters in public health when I had very limited health experience. But I think it's a really welcoming community and you can really find a space to you know, make the most impact at your organization. So definitely don't be intimidated to apply because of you know, limited health experience or a diverse set of skills. Can I jump in here as well? Sure. Um, just to say that uh, you know, you've heard from people who have master's degrees that ha went straight from undergrad into their master's program and then, um, you know, without a ton of work experience. But you don't need a master's either. I don't have a master's degree and, um, and I was a fellow and, and now I'm a staff member. So um, don't feel dissuaded um, if you don't have a master's degree and also don't feel dissuaded if you're coming right out of undergrad. Um, just undergrad not having done a master's. Um, we have many successful candidates uh, who don't have master's and also are coming straight out of undergrad. 
And I can say that it just adds to the the experience for us that we all come from this mix of diverse backgrounds. Um, and I have a lot of friends who, and myself included, who applied and said, I never thought I would even get a call, um, but I ended up here in this room, and I feel so special because of it. So just know that, like, give yourself a chance. There's, you know, you may not realize that your passion shows through more than anything, and that's really, we want people who are committed and dedicated to this work and to this field above all. So, um, so don't be intimidated. Um, and then next we're going to jump to Virginia. Um, if you could just tell us, Virginia, what were your experiences having applied multiple times um, before you were actually selected for a fellowship? Um, and do other people have a chance to get the fellowship if they've applied more than once? Thank you, Tiffany. Um, I applied twice. And the first time was in 2011, right out of my master's, and the second time was, well, clearly last year. Um, first of all, I don't think that applying twice uh, um, is a bad thing at all. It just shows that you really want to get into the program, and you just you that didn't just find it like looking for jobs online. You actually know about it, and even if you don't get through the first time, you still think about it one or two years after that. And for me, the first time I applied, <clears throat> there weren't really any positions that were matching my skill set and background, so I tried anyway, um, and didn't make it even to the first round. And then I waited two years, I went and did another job, and then tried again two years after, and the positions have changed. And I had two that really did match my skill set, the skill set that I had been building over the previous two years. So I applied as well, still thinking, oh, I, you know, I try, but I really don't think, you know, I was afraid I couldn't make it. And I made it to the first round for both positions. And then now I'm here. So it's really worth trying and keep trying. And it's such an amazing experience. It doesn't matter how many times you try. It just shows your passion and how much you want to be here. And it's worth it. Thank you, Virginia. That was great. Um, so yes, please apply multiple times. The more you apply, the more we know you really are sincere about wanting to join us. Um, and don't be discouraged. Um, just to say, that's not to say that many people don't get it on the first time. But yes, exactly like what Virginia and Tiffany said, that don't be discouraged. We, um, we do really appreciate, again, like what Virginia said, um, the dedication and the passion. And, and we, unlike some places who might have a restriction of amounts of times or hold it against you, we actually see it as really a commitment um, to your interest to Global Health Corps um, to have applied more than once if you didn't get in the first time. Thanks, Jen. Um, so, Debbie, we're going to jump over to you. If you could tell us, this was actually the top question asked, um, what was the most challenging experience for you and the worst part of the fellowship? Um, and people actually, a few people designated they wanted a surprising challenge, not something they would necessarily expect. Okay. okay. So I had a work challenge, but if I can start with a surprising challenge, maybe the first time trying to get around Kampala. Um, for people who don't know Kampala, Kampala is the capital of Uganda, and the traffic is horrendous. I mean, I thought LA traffic was bad, but it takes two hours to get from my place to town. So it's pretty, it's pretty hor horrific. I mean, and there's no way that you can get through all of the different cars unless, and I don't want to say this, but sometimes it is a fact of life until, unless you ride a boda boda, which is a motorcycle that is incredibly unsafe, and I do not recommend anyone trying it unless they really have to get somewhere. But that's the, I guess that's my surprising challenge, is trying to figure out, you know, how, the right price, not getting charged too much, how to tell the driver how to get to where I need to go when there are no street signs, 
how to hold on for dear life so I don't fall off, and all of that good stuff. But that, I had the help of all of the wonderful Ugandan fellows and all of the American fellows help me out. And by the end of the year, I think I was pretty good at um, kind of figuring out how much to charge. And I could sweet talk some of the Boda drivers so they, you know, don't charge me too much or give me something extra, like extra, I don't know, extra shillings or something. But <laughs> work to challenge. To cut in for one second, just because I yeah. feel like I need to do this as the staff member, we yes, highly please. do not recommend using Boda Boda, but if you do, we do require everyone to wear a helmet. And I'll talk about safety later, but I just wanted to put that out there. Yes. <laughs> And what Jen said, all of us in Uganda had helmets, and if we needed to take a boda anywhere, we were always holding on to our helmets. We always made sure that we were safe. But work-wise, and I think the most challenging and frustrating part was for me was realizing that sometimes what I thought were priorities were not the priorities of the organization that I was working it with or with the people that I was working with. And I remember in the beginning having that being very difficult because you know after the two week training you're very excited and you're very ready to affect the kind of change that you want and then you get to your workplace and you come to realize it's not really as easy as you had imagined. But you know the experience is very humbling and I think that those experiences um, really are helpful for you to start understanding your role in the organization, your role with your coworkers, your co-fellows, your friends, and really how in the future it's really important to, you know, kind of foster those kind of relationships and trying to understand the system first before trying to change anything. Thank you, Debbie. Um, and just to add to what Debbie said, as I was listening to her, I was thinking. We, if you aren't aware, we have a fellows blog that's on the GHC website, um, and I really encourage you to check that out for challenges. Um, a lot of us had used that as an outlet to explain a lesson that we learned or something that happened to us throughout the year, um, and I can think of several for myself that I shared. Um, and so I, I think reading those will give you a really good idea of what fellows face and what they're learning and going through. Um, and also, like, how how we're all learning about global health on the ground in the field, like, the realities of global health seem to be a very constant challenge, um, whether they be the realities of the workplace and nonprofits or global health in the field where you're not expecting resource limitations and all sorts of different things. So please do uh, check out our blog after this and see what else you can learn there, okay? Um, we're going to jump a question and go... On to um, Siobhan, we're going to ask you um, advice that you wish you knew before you started that you can now give to future fellows. So stuff that isn't already listed online um, that you wish that you had known in advance. Yeah, so originally when I wanted to apply to Global Health Corps, I was really interested in traveling abroad. I was able to study abroad in Sub-Saharan Africa as an undergrad, and I was really excited to go back and work in Global Health. However, I think one thing I really learned during the application process was that it's very important to focus on the specific job description and how best you can fit an organization. So I was lucky to hear Raj Punjabi, who's the executive director of Last Mile Health speak last summer, and he really inspired me. He was talking about the need for rural health care delivery in Liberia, and it was something I really wanted to contribute to. So when the placements actually came up on the website, just like they did today, um, I looked at Last Mile Health and I realized that my set of skills that really, you know, aren't that much from a health background but more from a human rights-based background were very applicable. So I had skills, you know, in communications and in grassroots fundraising that I could then apply to Last Mile Health Station. So I think that would be my biggest piece of advice to potential applicants is to really look at what organizations are looking for and be really passionate about that work. Awesome. Thank you, Siobhan. And we're going to have Virginia, if you have anything quick to add to that, can jump in. Yeah, thank you. I mean, the main thing that I wish I knew before I started applying and the fellowship as well was 
I wish I knew I would need to be able to articulate not just my skill set uh, and my technical capabilities, but also my passion and my dedication to global health and to social justice. Because I wasn't able to actually express that. I had it inside, but I never really um, learned how to say it. I almost ruined my application. I almost failed it. Um, and now that I made it, I'm so glad because throughout the program, really through um, Steel Harbor and the training and all the um, retreats that we do with the fellows and with GHC, I'm learning how to discuss these kind of things. But without, I feel like I would have never had, and it's such a useful thing to learn, both for your life and your job and work. Great, thank you. Um, so now we're going to jump uh, just back to Jen briefly um, because I feel like you're probably the best to answer this question. A very popular question is what application recommendations can you give to ensure that my application will stand out? Um, and specifically a lot of people asked about essays, um, how to write the essays to GHC's liking, what you're looking for in the essays, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, that is a great question and, and definitely one I know that a lot of people are curious about. And I think that both Siobhan and Virginia um, hit on a lot of the major big points that I would say. Um, first and foremost, we're not looking for people who want to use this as a resume patter or to get their experience abroad or because they want to get in their, foot, their foot in the door at an organization that they've been wanting to work at. We're looking for people who want to be a part of something bigger than them. We're, we're trying to mobilize a movement, and, um, and that movement needs commitment, it needs passion, it needs dedication, and it needs longevity. And, um, and so we want people who are interested in standing with us for the long haul. Um, and having that come across in your application is really important, um, showing that this is about something more than just this year and this um, fellowship, but that it's about being part of a community. Um, I think that's the most important thing. Um, and so, like Virginia said, being able to articulate that in a way that shows your passion and shows your dedication um, and, and your thoughtfulness is very important. Um, and then to what Siobhan said, I think at the same time we are filling needs of organizations and while this is definitely a professional development and a learning opportunity, these fellowships are real full-time jobs where organizations um, are looking to the fellows to perform um, you know, major uh, changes within the organization and in the places where they've identified these needs and so um, we need people who also have the skills and um, I, I want you to take that with a grain of creativity in that um, these skills look a lot of different ways so Aaron had mentioned earlier how his skills you know he has an environmental health background I mean it's not quite exactly um, what Vecna's job description is where he's at but he had enough of the experience that were translatable enough um, that it did end up being a really fantastic fit. And so um, looking at your skills but recognizing that you can sort of um, be flexible with what your skills are when looking at the required skills for these, um, these different jobs and sort of trying to figure out how you do fit into, into what they're looking for. Um, I think those are the two most important things when filling out your application. Thank you, Jen. That was great. Um, and I do have to say, I really like Aaron's um, quick responses here. If anybody else on the Hangout has paper and a marker that wants to submit their two cents that way, I think it's genius. Um, so Aaron, if you didn't read it, said, be yourself. And I think that's key. And I wrote, I need to find a marker, but I wrote, show your passion. Um, that is something that really stands out. We can tell when people are authentic and passionate and when they're just writing to get a position that they're not really sure that they want. Um, and I would just like to add one other thing. Um, after we read the applications and the, and the whole process, um, the semi, so 
not only the staff but also the fellows and alumni read the application. So they're a part of getting to choose um, who's coming into the community. Um, and then in addition, sort of the next step in the application process is getting to be interviewed as a semifinalist by someone in the global health core community. So either a uh, fellow alum or staff member or GHC ally. Um, so just getting giving you a little bit more context for, context for what the next steps are after the application. Um, and the follow-up with that question was, uh, how do you recommend choosing the best positions for me? Um, and I'll just tail in what Jen was saying is, you need to like really look at this as also a job application. So you do need to be able to match your skills and to be confident that you can meet the needs of the organization. Um, they do have a say in who they choose because it's a job position for them. Um, so be sincere with that. Don't just apply to the things that sound the most glamorous to you. Also, really be thinking about where you can fit best in and be the biggest asset to the team. Um, and Jen kind of covered that a little, so I'll end it there. But um, take, take a long time on looking through the fellow bios, looking through the positions, and see what matches you well. I do actually want to add one other thing, yeah. so just a personal <laughs> anecdote. In terms of figuring out what works best for you, um, what I, I really wanted to, um, to work for Partners in Health. I was very excited about that. Um, obviously, as I'm sure you recognized, I didn't. I ended up working for Baylor International Pediatric AIDS Initiative. Um, that was where I was much better equipped and qualified um, to work for them. Um, and so it's sort of, and I also applied to a partners in health position, and I, I did get through the first round and was very wisely not selected for it because um, I wasn't the best fit, even though I did have some experience. But that's just to say, like, don't hold on to those things. If there's an organization that you're like, oh my gosh, I just want to figure out how to fit myself into this so that it makes sense, it, it's not going to work. Um, it, it just, it's not. But it's not about the organization, it's about like your skills and what you can bring to whichever organization it is that you're going to be working for. And so um, don't, don't be holding on to organizations that you really want to work for necessarily. Thank you. Okay, we're going to jump in and I'm just going to remind you guys we're kind of restricted for time, so we're going to do this lightning round. So give us quick answers um, so that we can get to our Twitter questions at the end. Um, so Latifa, this is the post-fellowship question. Um, what did you do post-fellowship? Um, is it possible to be applying to other things towards the end of your fellowship? A lot of people asked if they could apply to med school while they were in the program, like working on applications. Um, and like, what, what does that look like as an alum? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, it, Finishing the Global Health Core Fellowship, for those of you who remember finishing your first degree is a lot like, what are you going to do when you graduate? What are you going to do post, you know, Global Health Core? But the, the, the exciting thing again to me comes back to knowing that you have a lot of different people who are going through that similar experience. And, you know, I, personally, I applied for graduate schools, I was applying for jobs. And another thing that we probably didn't mention, depending on your organization and the capacity that it has, some fellows get retained by their organizations for permanent positions. So you could do work and maybe you've done a fantastic job on a project and your organization has the ability, they're not mandated to do that, but if they have the resources and the capacity, some fellows get retained. Then for especially the fellows in the continent, you know, people learn about resources. The GHC website has resources on applying to grad school, so scholarship opportunities. It's not easy, but the resources are all there for you to utilize. So there is definitely time. I know one of the fellows that joined my placement, but the American fellow wanted to apply to um, medical school, and that's one of the questions that he raised to me. And I knew one of the fellows who was doing the same thing, so I connected him to another fellow who was applying to medical school and studying for the MCATs. So again, with our network and our community, just never be quiet if you have a question or you're looking for a resource or you're looking for something to do because there is always that other fellow who knows about how to help you. So, you know, in short, you can apply to grad school, apply for jobs, and 
you know, you have GHC helping you with CVs and you, you have the support in order to make that leap to the next phase. Thank you, Latifa. That was great. Um, I'm going to jump over to Siobhan to just tell us really quickly, um, give us a one-minute spiel on how it's been to work with your co-fellow and what that partnership looks like. Yeah, my co-fellow has definitely been the highlight of my fellowship. Um, I was a little nervous since we were going to be sitting about five feet apart from each other every single day at Last Mile House and also living together. Um, but it's worked out really well. One thing I've really appreciated is that I'm actually from New England, and so being a Global Health Corps fellow placed in the same state that you've been working and living in for the past five years is not a huge change. But it's been really wonderful to kind of see New England through Ben's eyes. He's from Kenya. And kind of him asking me all the different things about New England culture, why I'm, I love maple syrup, like weird things like that has been super fun. Um, also, I've been able to learn a lot from him since he has a lot more work experience than I do. And it's been just a really wonderful collaboration. Thank you. Um, now for Debbie, one minute or less. How has adapting to a new culture been? And I think you touched on this a little bit. Um, with your challenges question, but what about the new food, the rural environment, maybe leaving a long-distance relationship, that kind of stuff? Sure, so I have to give the highest praise to my co-fellow Carol, my co-co fellow Robinson, and all of the Ugandan fellows, Latifa included, because they really helped me and I know that they helped the other American fellows just get situated into the country. And even if, you know, I was in Kampala and it was the transition was a lot easier for me coming from a city to moving to another city than others who are in the rural areas but still having the Ugandan fellows really take us under their wing and showing us around whether going to the right markets to buy food or knowing how to haggle or how to greet everyone or how to avoid all of the marabou storks that are walking around in the city. But yeah, so <laughs> Big talk to all of them. Thank you, Debbie. Um, <laughs> so just to add to that, I was in, since I, I think I'm the only one on the call that was in a rural location, um, I was with Partners in Health in Rinkwavu, which is a rural a village out near the border with Tanzania and Rwanda. Um, and I was coming from New York, so it was a very big change for me. And I think that... Uh, for me, the support network that GHC provided was really key um, to be able to have people I could talk to constantly and source support, you know, whether it's like a nice meal in the city when I would come into town or just somebody to talk to um, when I felt a little isolated. Um, and I, I generally felt like that GHC ensured that I had, a, and Partners in Health ensured that I had a good environment even though I was in a, a rural area that didn't have access to, you know, all of the ease of access to resources that you would have in a city. Um, and so I think that you should take it seriously when you're applying to a rural context and make sure that you're prepared for that mentally and emotionally and physically, um, but also know that, you know, you have a good community, like, supporting you and at your back. And could I add one more thing, like, really quickly? Sure. Yeah. So... Just Tiffany mentioned the community and really please, like the, one, the most wonderful part about this is the community and especially if it's your first time being away from your family or your loved ones or your partners, you know, please look into or look to the GHC community as a second family and I know that sounds a bit cheesy but that's how it felt like to me when I was in Uganda. So it wasn't as difficult uh, living somewhere else for a year. I agree completely, Debbie. I felt like my family, I had family there with my GHC fellows. And I am actually married, and I was away from my spouse for the entire year. Um, and it was very challenging. I would say that would be one of my top challenges. And I know Debbie can relate to the long-distance relationship stuff, but um, it's possible. And I did it, and I'm still married, still alive. <laughs> um, so just know that, you know, the, this community and this support network is really key to success in your work and in your personal life. Um, overall, it's just been phenomenal. So um, we're going to jump to the next question. Erin, tell us what a typical day is like, and tell us also why this is a really tough question to answer 
to a group of potential applicants? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so this is a tough question to answer for a few reasons. One is that it, I don't know how much you guys have looked at the job descriptions that just went up today, but it's going to differ for every organization and every placement within an organization because you know there's 140 placements and there's probably 100 different things that those placements cover. Um, and that's tough for me because my co-fellow and I pretty much every day are doing something different. Um, at Vecna we have projects um, in four different countries and right now Dan is actually at our site in Zanzibar um, so his and my days are very different right now because I'm in Boston um, but also it's just uh, you know, you're going to be doing 500 different things and you're going to be interfacing with people at your placement and then also with people from GHC and probably going to be challenged to work on projects you didn't think you were able to and um, you're going to find out through, you know, through the support networks that we have in place that you are able to work on them. Um, but it really just comes down to no day is the same and they're all exciting. And Tiffany, I think you're muted. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> that was wonderful. I was looking for my next question. Um, so we're going to jump back over to Latifa. Miss Latifa, um, if we can get it to move here. There we go. Ooh, maybe. Sorry, we're having a little slow internet situation. Latifa, are you on there? Can you unmute yourself for me? Um, tell us, Latifa, about the top lessons you learned and the skills that you walked away with. Okay, so in terms of lessons learned and skills, I think one that I have to start with are actual tangible work skill set, like grants management. So I started out working... Um, on grants, developing proposals, and supporting the districts to develop work plans and budgets. I think we might have lost the TIFA for a minute. Can everybody else still No, over $3 million. And initially, it was really my own districts. So... Okay, we're gonna we're gonna move on, Latifa. I think that your internet just cut out for us, so maybe we'll have somebody else answer that question. Um, any volunteers for what you walked away with for skills, or I could maybe? How about I just answer that? Because um, we're having everybody's internet's freaking out a little bit. Um, so skills that I acquired, I came in with research skills, um, and I moved into monitoring and evaluation. And the biggest skills that I learned were working in a new environment. Um, I learned a lot of technical skills as well, but for me, the biggest thing that I learned was how to work in a new culture um, and how to communicate properly in a new culture in a way that was effective professionally um, and respectful professionally in that different um, society. So uh, I think Americans tend to want to be very, very gung-ho and um, prove themselves and I learned very quickly that, that um, Rwandan culture values things, you know, they still very much value getting things done and being professional and successful, but they also really value relationships in a different way. And that was a great skill for me to walk away with um, and feel like that I can communicate on a whole new level now. So, um, so there will be a lot of technical things and things that you take away and that all just depends on your individual job. Um, but I think that there will also be collective skills that we have all probably experienced in some way or another. Um, so jumping on to, uh, to Debbie, if you could just tell us some of, like a minute or less again, uh, some of the experiences that you um, have had being an alum. Um, so how are you connected post-fellowship? What are the benefits? What are, you know, what's exciting? Sure, so 
I think one of the biggest benefits for me is I just gained a family and a family of like-minded individuals who have wonderful personalities of their own and people who I can exchange ideas with, whether it's work related or whether it's personal um, personal questions that I have. And the nice thing that I um, cherish about the fellowship is that even from day one, it's the relationship building that's most important um, for this fellowship. Because not only do you need to build a relationship with your co-fellows or with the other JHC alums, but you need the skill set or you need the skill to build relationships with in your other endeavors, so work-wise, personal lives, things like that. And so no matter what questions or what thoughts you have, you know, whether it's on funding opportunities for an organization that you're working at or advice on applying to a job or to graduate school or who the next person you're going to digitally stork is, which is a shout out to the 2012-2013 class being connected is wonderful. Um, <laughs> thank you, Debbie. Nobody looked that up. It's scary. Um, moving on. So, <laughs> so Aaron, um, I'm going to ask you now. Uh, do you feel the work you're doing as a fellow will be sustainable um, after you leave? What is your approach taken for your work? Is it a top-down philosophy or bottom-up, or how are you feeling with this? Um, yeah, I absolutely feel like our work is going to be sustainable, and uh, I think that that has a lot to do with the way Vecna Cares operates, but it seems like it's something that I see in common with a lot of the other GHC placement organizations, in that um, with our work, so um, yeah, with our projects we've really taken a bottom-up approach, you know, we're designing um, basically technology and very pared down healthcare IT for clinics in rural areas. Um, and in that design process, we do it on the ground with midwives in the clinic, um, specking features specifically so they will fit what those groups need. And we stay there on the ground with them. You know, Granted, I've been here for about five months now, but as an organization, we've been doing it on the ground with uh, with the same clinics for two and a half years and counting. Um, and it's not about just dropping in and leaving something with people and running away and hoping it keeps going, but it's, it's about really having an ongoing relationship and sticking it out to make sure your work is, is uh, sustainable. So even though I'll leave, the organization is still going to be here and still going to be doing the same exact stuff and hopefully helping people. I'd like to add, um, this is a question that I get fairly often um, because people are concerned when you're at a place for a year, what is the sustainability of, and what is what really can your impact be? Um, and that's something we're very mindful of because um, we recognize that turnover can be um, difficult for organizations. And so uh, during our training, something that we focus on providing is a transition training to really make sure that as the outgoing fellows are preparing to leave, um, they really put into place a plan to make sure that or institutional knowledge is not lost in the process. Um, for most of our placements, there will be a new fellow coming in, and so part of that transition will be training the new fellow and making sure that they're up to speed on everything, um, transitioning over all their information, contacts, um, and the like. But for organizations where we aren't having fellows continue, we still want fellows to be really mindful of making sure that they've organized everything to give to their supervisor, whoever is going to be taking on their projects, um, to make sure that institutional knowledge is not lost. It's something that's incredibly important to us. Thanks, Jen. That's great. Um, so one more, one more question from our from our submissions earlier, and then we're going to take a couple quick Twitter questions. Um, so for Siobhan, how has this influenced your career trajectory so far? Or has it? And let's keep it to like a minute or less if you can. Yeah. So I've been really passionate about human rights since I was little, but I never really was sure exactly the best way for me to contribute to that. Um, and I've been really excited by the human right to health, and that's what really drew me to Global Health Forum, you know, being part of an 
a wider movement for the, the right um, to health worldwide. And I think just having this experience has really reaffirmed that that is the best possible thing I could be working on. So it's made me very excited to keep working in this field um, and hopefully keep working for, you know, great organizations like Last Mile Health. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to take a couple of live questions now since we're wrapping up. Um, and I do have to say that this is now our Google Effects time. Um, so we can tr really show you our true colors. Uh, so feel free to let it show, guys. Uh, let them really know what they're getting themselves into here. <laughs> um, so from Twitter, Alan Jones asks us, can I work on the weekends or go to school part-time during my fellowship? And I think that I'm going to nominate Jen to answer that one. Jen, you're on mute. Thank you. I said, sorry, I'm putting my party hat on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we expect that this is um, every fellow's number one priority and their full-time um, what, what they're what they're um, committing full time to. That being said, we definitely have fellows who have taken classes at night or on the weekend, um, or even in the morning. We had an amazingly ambitious fellow who would get up before work and go take a French class. Um, so things like that are possible. We've also had fellows who are in maybe the last stages of researching and, and completing to write their thesis, things like that. However, um, we do expect that this is um, your number one uh, priority and, um, and what you're going to be spending the majority of your time and your year doing. Since this is a full-time job, we're expecting fellows to really perform well for organizations, um, and that requires a lot of time and commitment. Awesome. Thank you, Jen. Um, another Twitter question from Lisa. Is there an advantage for those who submit their applications earlier, or does, not, does it not matter when you submit? Um, I'm going to go out on a leaf and say, as long as you get in before the deadline, I don't think it makes any difference. Just yeah. get it in and get all the requirements in on time. And if you have some difficulty for some reason getting a requirement in on time, then um, reach out and let us know what what is holding you up. Um, I know, Jen, maybe you can answer this. Some people are saying that their transcripts might not be available in time. Um, so is that an issue, or how, how is GHC handling that? Um, if, if there are any issues, they should reach out directly to us, and we can handle it on a one-on-one um, -on -one basis. Okay. Um, but for so for letters of recommendation, um, they should definitely follow up with the people who are writing their letters of recommendation, um, and you know, make sure that they're getting them in on time. Okay. Um, and I think that's all that we have time for. Thank you so much for submitting questions and giving us your feedback and your interest. We're very excited um, that you have all joined us today, and we're having way too much fun probably with the Google effects now. Um, but I do want to say uh, just one more question for everybody um, that you have one word answer for is how so far or you know your whole year or part of your year that you're in now, give us a one word summary of your experience with GHC um, or like the highlight, one word highlight for you. Um, and who is ready to go first? Do I get to pick on people? Aaron, you look ready. All right. Um, well, first of all, I want to give a shout out to the wonderful fellows <laughs> in DC who I miss very much and who have been via text feeding me things to write on signs. Um, <laughs> and I've got to say, yeah, one word. It's it's been wild. Awesome. I like that. Debbie. <laughs> Let's see. My one word is storks. No, no. <laughs> no, my one word is fantastic. Fantastic, Debbie? Yes. Okay. Jen. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, can I can I say two words? Two Sorry, words. I was thinking like lifetime commitment. I didn't want to say family. I, I but but I, I feel like um, lifetime commitment, sort of lifetime. 
<laughs> Latifa. You're on mute. Yeah, my one word would probably be transformative. Mm, that's a good one. Man, always get the best word. Siobhan. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my word is in my language, but you can understand it anyway. It's incredibile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, and... Yeah, now I was focusing on all your words, and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just say it's been very rewarding. Rewarding would be the top one for me. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, I want to encourage you to continue to follow the website um, and make sure that you check for updates on the applications. Read the fellows' blogs because a lot of your questions will be answered much more in depth there than what we have time for today. Um, and reach out if you have additional questions. We'll, we'll be trying to do a second hangout maybe in January. Um, so just stay tuned for that. Um, and then finally, reach out on the website. We'll be looking at the FAQs list that's up and trying to add more if there's things that are commonly asked here that we can make sure we cover there. Um, so know that you aren't, even if you haven't had your answer now, that you'll have, um, there will be other opportunities to get answers, so be persistent, and if you're in one of these parties right now, I just want to give a shout out. Um, I'm so excited. We have people live downstairs um, in New York City. We have people um, live in D.C., um, and we love you and we miss you, and we'll also be having people at parties in San Francisco and Boston on Tuesday, December 10th. Um, so be sure to check us out. We really want to meet you. We really want to welcome you to our community. Um, and we're grateful for you taking the time to spend with us on your busy December Friday evening, we're sure. Okay? <laughs> Thank Bye, you guys. all so much. Bye. Um, and remember, January 26th is the due date. And while you don't need to turn it in beforehand. Um, the earlier, the better. We do appreciate it. Um, and if you have any questions, like Tiffany said, we're very excited to answer them individually. Thanks. And everybody wants to say hi to their mom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, I will end with an amazing noise. Where are my sound effects? Applaud. <laughs> Somebody applaud me. <laughs> 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 <laughs>